wish I was a lime. I wish I was a lime. First of all, the hair and wardrobe department for this series deserve a serious raise because they understood the assignment and that assignment was create a woman who looks like she's just stepped out of a lesbian daydream. Specifically my daydream. We all need to just take a moment to appreciate Faye Malison serving Papito in an open shirt, slicked back hair and gay jewellery. How can jewellery be gay? I hear you ask. Well now you know. Respectfully, her hands have added 10 years to my lifespan. In fact, I may now be immortal. First Freen and now Faye. The universe wants me to pack my bags and move to Thailand. This is the message I'm receiving. The marketing for Thailand is marketing. Target audience reached. Yes, I'm here, I'm here. People have been harassing me to watch this series, to react to this series, to perform like a gay jester. And I have to say, now that I'm all caught up with this series, I don't think that everyone is going to like what I have to say about about it. Because this series is a little controversial, it's a lot messy. I don't know what the writers were consuming in the writers room, but whatever it was clearly took them to a different cerebral plane than us mere mortals. There's a lot to unpack here, but we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Just remember, you asked for this. You asked for this. Hi guys, welcome to a video, and in today's video I'm just going to be reviewing episodes one to six of Blank the series. For those who are not familiar with this series, it's set in the same universe as Gap, the series, and it follows the love story between Sam's older sister, Nyung, and the much younger Ahn Nyung, who, between them, have a 16-year age gap. The two women try to overcome their families and societal norms, which keep their romance from flourishing. Yes, the two love interests do have a similar name, and there is a reason for that. Oh, there's a reason. And on that note, this video will contain spoilers. So if you've not seen the series, you have been warned. Also, I'd just like to apologise to the people of Thailand for my pronunciation of names in this video. I know it's not perfect, but I am trying my best. <sighs> the story of my life. And on that note, let's get into it. So I think the first thing that I'm going to discuss before anything else is the age gap aspect of this series because it is the most controversial thing about it. Now in Blank the series the character of An Nung is 20 and the character of Kun Nung is 36 but nothing actually happens between them until An Nung is 21. So there is a significant age gap of 15 or 16 years, but they are both consenting adults. Yoko Apazra, the actor who plays An Nung, is also currently 22 years old. And I looked up her age because she honestly looks like she could be as young as 15 years old. And before An Nung confirmed her age, I thought she was actually supposed to be a teenager in the series. So that factor, alongside An Nung's initial characterization, which is overly cute and childlike, does make some of An Nung's and Kun Nung's earlier scenes together quite uncomfortable to watch. I know that as the series unfolds, we learn that Ang Nung is overcompensating with that kind of behaviour to hide her more negative feelings, but that doesn't really change the fact that some of the earlier scenes are still uncomfortable to watch because of it. I also know that acting overly cute or like a kid, for example, Egyo in South Korea, is a popular thing that's adopted by some adults in certain parts of Asia. And by the way, if any Asian women are watching this and I say something that's misguided or problematic, please feel free to correct me in the comments section. This video is very much coming from a Western perspective, so I, I might say something ignorant, but I don't mean to be ignorant. Mm. But anyway, they even portray some of those childlike or overly cute mannerisms in Gap the series here and there, but the difference with Blank 
is that they made it An Noong's entire personality at the very beginning. So that combined with the fact that the actor looks like she's a teenager makes it feel as though you really are watching somebody who is like incredibly young, which in turn did make her initial dynamic with Kan Noong a bit weird. Also An Noong states that Kan Noong is the same age as her mother, which I felt suggested a problematic parallel between lesbian romance and mother-daughter relationships, which is especially questionable considering that An Noong also grew up without her mother. There was definitely an insinuation there, right? But on the other hand, An Noong's character does develop as the series unfolds. And once she starts to open up and let her authentic self show, the childlike aspects of her personality lessen. And she starts to act more her age, which does improve her dynamic with Kung Noong quite a lot. It's also worth noting that in the book that this series is adapted from, the character of An Noong is actually 18. So they did change that for the series, which was definitely the right move to make. I think. To be honest, I really enjoy age gap romances and I don't think that the age gap in blank is actually problematic at all. But I can see why some people would be put off by it because of the way that An Noong was initially portrayed. Even I thought it was a little bit weird. And now that's out of the way, we can move on to other things. So my favorite thing about this series has to be the character of Kan Noong. Not just because I have a crush on Faye. I mean, maybe a little bit. That's probably actually all of it. You got me. Because she's so well written and three-dimensional. For example, Noong has a lot of positive qualities, she stands up for herself, she's caring, sensitive and protective. But at the same time, there's elements of her character which are shaped by the trauma she has from her turbulent relationship with her grandmother. For example, she doesn't process or communicate her feelings in the healthiest way. Instead, she's either avoidant or passive aggressive, and she's incredibly guarded, proud, and stubborn. And it's clear that because of her past, she has a real issue with being vulnerable. So whenever she gets hurt, she tends to lash out and distance herself instead of letting the other person know or see that she's hurt. And all of these different multitudinous aspects to her personality just made her such an interesting and fleshed out character. She's not vanilla ice cream and uh, I like that. And Faye totally killed this role. I mean, I was so impressed with her acting. She has an abundance of emotional intensity brimming beneath the surface at all times. And she knows how to utilize that and where to direct it in all of her scenes. And she does it in such an intelligent way, which really elevates her performance. Like Noong says so much without saying anything at all. And that's what I really love about Faye's acting. I, I love everything about Faye, to be honest, okay. Also, as discussed earlier, Noong is fine as hell. So fine, it's worth discussing again. <laughs> I mean, some of the visuals we got for free, the slicked back hair, the open shirts, her carrying her woman in the pouring rain. She even looks like a three course meal at her own grandmother's funeral. My ovaries, rest in peace. As discussed earlier, once we get over the initial compensating, we see that An Noong's character is also very layered. And as the series progresses, we see those layers get peeled back to reveal a vulnerable yet emotionally mature individual. In fact, by the end of episode six, it's clear that An Noong is a lot more emotionally mature than Kan Noong is, despite being so much younger and also dealing with her own trauma from her own abusive grandmother. And really, An Noong is dealing with a lot. Not only does she have a controlling and abusive grandmother, she has a mother who suddenly reappears in her life after being absent and expects to be the center of her world. And on top of that, she's also having to navigate her relationship with Kan Noong, who is a source of both comfort and anguish 
for her because Kan Nung is still dealing with her own issues and her own trauma, which impacts their relationship. She's dealing with like two sets of trauma, so it's quite an emotionally demanding role. But you can see that Yoko fearlessly embodies the character and puts everything that she has into her performance. Yoko also has great comedic timing and the humorous aspect of An Nung's character serves as a nice contrast to the darker aspect of Kan Nung's character. I think the funniest thing in the whole series is just how fearless An Nung is in her pursuit of Kan Nung. The way she just shows up and insists that they're girlfriends and that they're meant for each other. You gotta respect the delusion. You gotta respect the dedication to the cause. Oh, she was serving lesbian realness. She was. Of course, since Blank is set in the same universe as Gap, Sam and Mon also make an appearance, which is really fun. And I thought the actor who played Mon was such a good casting choice. She really reminded me of Gap series Mon. But the actor who played Sam felt completely different to Gap series Sam, and I know there's supposed to be a separate interpretation of the characters, but it did feel weird to me that Blank Mon was giving Gap Mon, but Blank Sam Sam wasn't giving Gap Sam. I think I just have Freen on the brain constantly, so it's like... But hey, it's not that deep, and it was also fun to see like a different interpretation of those characters, and we also got a kiss. We got a Mon Sam kiss to add to the collection, and for that, we thank you. Speaking of similarities to Gap, the figure of the traditional grandmother in blank also serves as the main antagonist. The editing and the dramatic music Music, make that crystal clear. I swear they treat the grandmas in this universe like boss battles. Somebody should make like a Tekken version of the Gap universe. That would be fun. Make the grandmas like the, the no, okay. But yes, on the one hand, having Kan Nung and An Nung's grandmothers as the main antagonists in blank does open up conversations about generational differences and all the homophobia, gender expectations expectations and internalized misogyny. That comes with that and that's passed down from woman to woman, which is really interesting to see play out on screen. But on the other hand, because of the way that the grandmothers are written, characterized and generally framed in the series, they are at times reminiscent of two-dimensional Disney villains where they're mean for the sake of being mean and and that meanness is not necessarily unpacked. And really, toxic behaviours in grandmothers or older women usually, not always, but usually stems from their own generational trauma and problematic notions that have been instilled in them growing up. And it would have been refreshing if the series had explored that a bit more. Even in something as simple as a conversation. To be fair, they do sort of hint at An Nung's grandmother having some kind of trauma because we see her crying after she hits An Nung and she also states that she doesn't want An Nung to be like her mother. I'm assuming because her mother got pregnant at a young age and didn't have the life that the grandmother wanted for her. But this is not really properly addressed, it's just kind of suggested. And I felt like they did gloss over quite a bit. With An Nung's grandmother. And it's the same thing with Kan Nung's grandmother who is very set in her homophobic ways and the conversation just tends to go round in circles rather than progressing or offering deeper insight. And then of course she dies so there's no real closure for Nung either. And I understand that that lends itself to building Nung's character and her own storyline. And it's also reflective of what happens in real life sometimes too. But even still, I do feel like more depth could have been added to both the grandmothers 
in this series. I mean, I realise that they're, you know, on a budget and they probably don't have time to kind of explore all of the lesser characters in, you know, quite the same way as the main characters, but that's just my two cents. Like, I think they could have done more with the grandmothers. That's just my two cents. I mean, the thing about the plot lines in blank, and I know it's supposed to be a soapy and dramatic production, is that they are ridiculous, but they somehow make it work. And I can't lie, parts of this series had me shook up. When An Nung's mother showed up at the school anniversary event, I gasped. I did not see that coming at all. And then to learn that she used to have a crush on Kun Nung, but then got pregnant. And Kun Nung encouraged her to get rid of the baby, but she chose to have that baby, named it after Kun Nung. And now Kun Nung is in love with that grown baby. And the father just happens to be the man Kun Nung was supposed to marry. I have no notes at all. Shakespeare found Found bold and shaking. I mean, he's already bold and he's also dead, so probably won't be doing much shaking. Like I said, the writers were clearly on a different cerebral plane to the rest of us. When they wrote this script, I mean, they even brought back the classic girl removes her glasses and is suddenly mesmerizing trope that used to plague cinema of old. We love a vintage touch. Iconic. Moving on to An Nung and Kun Nung's relationship. First of all, declaring your love to a woman before you've even kissed her, it's giving lesbian. If I'm honest, and I know some people won't like this, this is where the review gets a little bit controversial and people reach for their pitchforks. I know. I felt like their chemistry could have been better. There's certainly a connection there, but it's not one that really stands out to me as anything special. And I felt like Yoko was either unable to or hesitant to match Faye's charged intensity in a lot of their scenes together, which meant it felt like the attraction was much stronger on Nung's side, even though she was the one being pursued. I believe the actors actually ended up having to reshoot the love scene in episode six because it wasn't deemed good enough the first time around. And it seems to me that they needed that extra guidance in those scenes because they don't have an organic chemistry to fall back on. That said, they certainly knew how to build up tension, which is why their more physical scenes work despite that. For example, in the scene where they have their first kiss, An Nung is asking Nung the question of if she can love her back in that way, which creates a tense moment. And at first it looks like Nung has fallen asleep or is pretending to sleep, which draws out that moment before she finally kisses her back and releases all of that tension into their first kiss. And the way that scene is choreographed and directed alongside the actor's vulnerability is what makes it such a beautiful scene. But there's also something very timid about their actual physical intimacy, to the point where it looked like An Nung was almost scared to touch Nung properly at times, which doesn't really seem in character to me considering that she'd been so desperate to be physical with Nung and had been consistently testing Nung's physical boundaries boundaries up to that point. Then again, that could have been a purposeful acting choice considering that she's supposed to be young and inexperienced, and it also doesn't help that Kun Nung also has a level of restraint around her because she's conflicted about taking things a step further, which is a difficult thing to translate on screen without it looking awkward. And to be fair, their physical intimacy does improve in the post funeral love scene, but I suspect that's probably because they reshot it and made sure it looked good the second time around. I can imagine how that scene would have potentially looked awkward without the extra care taken in the direction of it, especially considering the grief aspect. And the reshoot definitely paid off because that scene does encompass a lot of vulnerability and intimate connection, which within the context of what was happening happening was much needed. And when Nung pulled An Nung back towards her, I may have ascended to a place 
that only lesbians can comprehend. Poetic cinema, ovaries never recovering, etc. I also love the small detail of the love bite on Noong's neck the morning after. Apparently An Noong has a biting kink in the novel, which is probably why they added that detail in. And I, for one, appreciated it and think it should be framed and put in an art gallery for all to see. And to be clear, I did enjoy their scenes together and they definitely have a level of connection, but it's apparent to me that their more physical scenes do need that added support of careful direction and choreography because they don't have an organic chemistry to fall back on. Oh, I'm prepared for the torches and pitchforks. I'm in my tower right now with all of my sentient furniture waiting to fight you. Really, I think their emotional intimacy was probably the strongest element in their scenes together. For example, their beach getaway scenes were brimming with so much tension and unspoken longing, particularly from Kan Nung, and that combined with their small moments of subtle intimacy together created an observable magnetism that was so engaging to watch. There's also this really cute parallel that the series draws between them. In the two scenes in which one of them is pretending to be asleep whilst the other is confessing their love, which was really heartwarming and underscored a further emotional connection between the two. Yeah, it was cute. Outside of their intimacy, there's both positive and negative aspects to their relationship. It is a complicated slow burn and that combined with the age gap and complexities of the characters makes it incredibly layered and interesting. You have Kan Nung who is very conflicted over the fact that she's supposed to be a role model for the young woman that she's fallen for and she's navigating this from a guarded place because of previous trauma. So this obviously complicates and adds layers to all of her interactions with An Nung. For example, when she lashes out at An Nung or treats her with cruelty, in a way it's evidence of how much she likes her and therefore feels hurt by any perceived rebuff. She lashes out in a toxic way because she cares. Yet on the other hand, their relationship also contains more positive aspects which allow for healthy character growth. For example, Kun Nung being the only one to actually ask An Nung what she wants as opposed to telling her what she wants makes her a positive influence that encourages An Nung to consider her own feelings and be more assertive. And we can also see that whenever Nung finds herself projecting the controlling attitude her grandmother projected onto her, she becomes self-aware and stops it happening. So through her relationship with An Nung, we see that she's capable of healthy growth as a character and that this relationship encourages that self-awareness and reflection in her. And then you have An Nung, who is the opposite of Kan Nung in so many ways. She's very open, perhaps too open, and unlike Han Nung, is willing to be vulnerable. And as a result of this, she finds herself consistently hurt by Han Nung's closed off behaviour. However, and here's what's interesting, An Nung is a lot more emotionally mature than Han Nung, which does bring some much needed balance to their relationship. For example, when An Nung catches Kan Nung coming home from dinner with the doctor, which, side note, I'm sorry, I ship Nung and the doctor so much. Their eye contact alone was a cultural reset and they would be life-changing as a couple. All I'm saying is I'm going to need a whole separate series exploring their backstory in high definition for professional medical purposes. <laughs> anyway, she's not afraid to call Kan Nung out on her behaviour and also communicate her feelings, which is much needed because without that, their relationship would just devolve into a lot of passive-aggressive mind games miscommunications. And really, that's the biggest twist in this series. It's that An Nung is established as the younger and more immature one, but actually her emotional maturity is what saves their relationship each time it's about to be torn apart. And Kan Nung is the one who has the most to learn 
through their connection. I mean, whichever way you look at it, their relationship is just incredibly interesting. Like a jar of organs in a science museum. And all of this in just six episodes. There's been so much drama already, I can't even imagine what's going to happen next. I don't sleep at night, I'm so terrified. Overall, I enjoyed Blank the series and I think it offers up some really interesting characterization and relationship dynamics, which go beyond the surface of what you would expect from this kind of production. And if you ask me, it's worth watching for the fey visuals alone. That said, I wasn't immersed in blank in the same way I was with Gap, but that just purely comes down to the difference in chemistry between the two main respective couples. And also I think the fact that An Nung looks so young was distracting. But one series doesn't have to be better than the other, they can both exist alongside each other in peace and be appreciated individually for what they are. So yes, there you go, there's my brew. Okay guys, if you've seen Blank the series, let me know your thoughts down in the comments section below. Don't forget to subscribe for instant disappointment and I'll see you guys soon. Bye!